One day, in less than 24 hours, the landscape explodes with these cicadas that seem to appear out of thin air like magic. Makes me think of the magic carp. I'm not going to catch them all though. Hey guys, Chris Ignato here, and uh, how you doing? So, it is May. I'm standing in a deciduous forest of eastern Pennsylvania. You might ask yourself, what's all the buzz about? Well, that is the chorus of Brood 10, the infamous Brood X of the periodic cicada. And its ranks are so legendary, it is often called the Great Eastern Brood. Get ready to learn something, come on. So I know this is very long-winded, but please bear with me. I mean, I only have this chance once every 13 or 17 years, so here it all goes. Cicadas belong to an order of insects known as the Hanoptera, not to be confused with Hemiptera, which are actually true bugs. The Hymenoptera include such insects as leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, sharpshooters, and even spittle bugs, these tiny little things in that little frothy spittle you see on plants. Years ago, I was looking at one of those very closely and filming it, and I couldn't help thinking to myself, this thing looks identical to a cicada without the wings. Go figure, they're closely related. In my opinion, cicadas are some of the most impressive insects to look at, um, and some of them are really beautiful. Another type known as the sharpshooter is very beautiful and striking to look at, but the periodic cicadas are really cool. They've got these black bodies, these vibrantly red or orange eyes that just really stand out, and they've got these clear wings, but all the veins on the wings are this vibrant, striking orange, and they just look really cool. It kind of looks like the Halloween insect, in my opinion, and I just love them. The swamp cicadas are also really beautiful. They've got gold on them, and instead of orange veins in their wings, they've got this, this bright green. Cicadas are cool. Aside from the two large primary eyes, cicadas also have three simple eyes on their foreheads, basically. Those simple eyes are known as a cilly, and they're pretty much only used for detecting light and dark. I guess that's pretty much to alert them if a bird flies by overhead about to snatch them up and swallow them down. There are over 3,000 species of cicada worldwide, and there are many members of the periodic cicadas. Periodic cicadas fall under pretty much two main categories. You've got the 13-year cicadas, and of course you've got the 17-year cicadas, which are not locusts, by the way. Ball that up and throw that out somewhere else. Locusts are grasshoppers. Back to the periodic cicadas. Now, there is some speculation as to why they spend so long underground. I mean, take brood 10, these, these insects will spend 17 years beneath the soil surface, several feet beneath the surface, feeding on the juices of tree roots. They're just drinking up tons of xylem and absorbing nutrients and amino acids, only to wait for the soil's temperatures to reach 64 degrees, where they leave the subsurface, climb up the, the nearest object, which is usually a tree, shed that skin, and become their adult form, which is their fifth instar. Their back will kind of split open. Remember, it's just a shell. And they'll pull themselves out of their, their former exoskeleton. Then they'll hang by it, and they'll pump blood into those tiny little wing buds. Those wings will slowly inflate. And within a couple to four days or so, their skin will be fully cured, and they'll be ready to sing and fly all over the place and find a mate and begin the love. And then they only live a couple of weeks to find a mate, reproduce, and die. The 13-year cicadas pretty much do the same thing, but it only takes them 13 years. So I'm sure you're asking yourself, why the long wait? 
Well, there are several theories as to why they spend so long underground. One of them, of course, is kind of the obvious. You've got safety in numbers, right? They surely overwhelm any predators by their vast numbers. The predators are completely unable to exhaust that food supply and some of them actually just kind of stress out over it and leave. But then, you know, you've got certain predators that specialize on them, such as the cicada killer. And I'm actually wondering about that right now. This year we're going to have a ton of cicadas. So the cicada killers are going to capture the cicadas, paralyze them, lay their eggs on them, bury them beneath the ground. Next year we're going to have a ton of cicada killers emerging, but there's probably not going to be quite the food supply to continue the life cycle next year. So a lot of those cicada killer wasps will probably not be able to reproduce. So 13, 17 years, those are prime years, right? Those are prime numbers, and it makes it difficult for predators to synchronize their life cycles with the emergence of the cicadas. That's pretty neat. But there's a, another theory which I lean even more towards, which is pretty extraordinary in some ways. And I barely understand it at the moment, but cicadas have been around for a long time. They were here during the, the glaciers. And as those glaciers receded, the survival conditions were harsh. There might not have been a ton of trees. The climate and temperature was up and down. Predators could have been overwhelming and stuff. And there were certain cicadas that had mutations in their genes that made them spend longer periods as in their nymph stage, you know, underground. If they bred with another species or you know, other individuals that had shorter gestation stages or growth stages, they wouldn't get that gene to spend 17 years or 13 years beneath the ground. They might spend just a couple of years on the ground like other species of cicada. So <clears throat> having that 13 years or 17 years greatly reduces the odds of sort of accidental hybridizing with other species of cicada, allowing them to keep that specialized growth cycle and long-term on the ground, which in the long run favors them for the likelihood of perfect conditions when they emerge. We have no idea how cicadas know when it's their year. Perhaps sap guides their molecular clocks. Now it is only the periodic cicadas that synchronize their mass emergings. None of the other 3,000 species of cicada actually do that. Cicadas, like other members of the Hymenoptera order, are xylem feeders. That means they feed exclusively on the juices of plants and trees. Well, those juices have a lot of water content and not a whole lot of nutritional value to them. The cicadas depend on certain amino acids and vitamins in order to survive. They can't do it on their own though. So there is a, a really cool endosymbiotic relationship between the cicadas and three species of gut bacteria that allows them to survive. These symbiotic bacteria actually provide the cicadas with those essential amino acids and vitamins for them to survive. And of course the cicada provides a safe home for the bacteria to live in. And of course, those bacteria also get certain nutritions and nutrients and stuff from the, from the stomachs of the cicadas. Now, predators aren't the only things cicadas have to worry about. Of course, they've got to contend with food sources and pesticides and environmental pollutions and stuff. But there's also a fungus that specializes on them known as Massospora cicadina. And that is kind of crazy. You might have heard of it. It's the cicada zombie fungus, right? So you got these zombie cicadas roaming the landscape where their body's taken over by this chalk-like fungus, filling up their entire body cavities and, well, eventually leading to their demise. Many of them still get to mate uh, before they perish, but of course that mating process spreads the spores of the fungal infection. So if you want to learn more about that, there's a lot of good videos on YouTube right now speaking specifically about the Massaspora cicadina. So the next topic I want to touch base on is, of course, how does something so small make so much noise? <laughs> They're not the only things capable of this. Just take a look at the spring peeper. 
Sometimes a big thing can come in a small package. Well, the way cicadas can get so loud is most of this abdomen is hollow and that's what provides the resonating chamber that produces such a large, loud volume. And only the males, of course, produce this, this loud chorus. They've got these little organs known as timbles. And those timbles basically flex. Imagine having like a soda can or one of those clicker toys and when you click on it, you bend that can, the metal kind of bends and it makes a click. And when it goes back, it makes another click. Imagine doing that striation a thousand times a minute you get that buzzing sound. You've got the resonating chamber and it amplifies that buzzing sound and before you know it you've got this incredible song. Multiply that by hundreds or thousands of individuals. Keep in mind that during this emergence of Brood 10 you can actually have one and a half million cicadas per acre. Think about how loud that must get. There are people that get vertigo and migraines, they get dizzy and all sorts of other ailments from the sheer overwhelming volume of the symphony these cicadas are responsible for. These massive courses are known as aggregations. Okay, so you just heard where they're all synchronizing over there. Listen to this over here. Totally different sound, right? If cicadas sing to each other, that must imply that they've got ears. And here's their ear. It's not quite as complex as a mammal's ear, but of course it gets the job done and it's kind of neat. I wonder if that ear is capable of detecting bat radar. You know, maybe the cicada's in flight, it hears a bat, and it just drops to the ground, similar to that of, say, the praying mantis. And the bat continues flying by in search for food. I don't know. The males will actually fly from tree to tree, singing their song. They'll fly up to one tree, sing for a couple of minutes, then they'll fly to another tree and repeat the process, in hopes to hear a female answering in return. She often does this little clicky-type song, um, it's and sometimes it's just actually a single click and the bales like whoo Someone's interested in me and he comes on up and he's like hey, how you doing and he starts singing a different song to her He's like well, you know What's your sign? And he starts doing his thing and if she likes him, she's like well uh, Want to come back with me? Now fortunately for the cicadas they're actually capable of mating several times during their short adult lifespans. Both the males or females can mate several times before they succumb to old age. The female will use her ovipositor to slice open the bark of twigs and other plant stebs and deposit her eggs within. And a female will generally lay anywhere from one to a few dozen eggs in one, one location and throughout her short adult lifespan she can lay somewhere around 600 eggs. Of course, most of those eggs will never make it to adulthood. Those eggs take somewhere between six to 10 weeks to hatch, and the little larva will drop to the ground, burrow beneath the ground, and begin that long period of eating and eating and eating, some sleeping and more eating before they emerge in 13 or 17 years. These periodic cicadas, you probably only have them for about a month before they all disappear. Aside from being attracted to the answers of potential mates, cicadas can also be drawn to vibrations. So of course, say you're mowing the lawn or using power tools or something, you have a good chance of attracting many cicadas. But cicadas are completely harmless. I've had to convince so many people so many times that they were never bitten by cicada. If anything, they felt the little hooks on their feet as they're walking across them. One thing led to another and they, 
you know, the person got scared and thought they were about to get bitten or pinched or stung, and then, you know, the mind took over the rest. Cicadas are harmless species as far as bites and stings are concerned. Now remember, I said that the cicadas are hominoptera, right? And that they greatly resemble the leaf and tree hoppers and even the spittle bugs. Well, I'm not joking. You got to look at these things. They are almost identical to each other. The only difference are some of the colors and the wings and of course their size. They all have the same structure with eyes on both sides of their face. They have that sort of sucking, piercing mouth part if they even have one in their adult stage. They've got that blunt, robust abdomen and in many cases they've got rather striking looking wings. And it's really fun. If you have the opportunity, just try looking closely at a spittle bug. Uh, just try not to hurt it. These things are tiny. Just touching it could break its legs. And uh, compare it to the cicada. It's really fun to see how identical these things really are. So uh, yeah, those are the cicadas. What an incredible species of insect and I just can't believe the, the incredible numbers we've got you know, happening across the eastern half of the country. Many people in the world will never get to see something like this unless it's something terrible like locust plagues, actual locust plagues, none of this mixing the names up thing. Thank you so much for watching. I, I hope you like this video. I hope you get out there and enjoy it while it lasts. And if the cicada thing is creeping you out, just remember, there's nothing to worry about and it'll all be over real soon. With nothing left to show for it except for millions and millions of corpses and empty shells upon the trees. Chris Ignato. Signing out. The wonders of the world of entomology. I'm so glad I'm a human. I'm so glad I'm large. <laughs>